today we're going to talk about microservices. Because before that, something about me. I am a consultant from ThoughtWorks, Singapore, full stack engineer. And I also co-founded IdeaBoards, which is a um, uh, retrospective tool. Uh, this is my Twitter handle and GitHub handle. Uh, enough about me. Uh, what's in for you? So we're going to talk about what are microservices, uh, why microservices, how microservices, and when do we use those microservices? How many of you have heard about microservices? Wow. How many of you have actually used microservices or wrote code? Cool. Um, so let's uh, define microservices. Uh, there is no formal definition per se, but before jumping onto that, let's talk about uh, what are services. Um, it's just an implementation of a contract, right? You have some contract, and uh, the service actually implements that particular contract and tells you that if, hey, if you call me with these, these parameters, I'm going to do something for you. What happens if you attach a micro to the microservice? Um, so micro, as the name suggests, it should be small. We're going to talk about what is small. It should be independent. It should be self-contained. It uh, should perform on itself. It should be composable. It, the each service uh, should work together with all the other microservices. And it does one thing, and that one, it does that one thing well. Um, that's, the, that's the key. Um, but what is the right size? We talk about microservices. There is a lot of uh, conversation around what should be the size of the service. Uh, some people rate size based on uh, lines of code. Like, if it's beyond 200 lines of code, it's not a microservice. Some people uh, think about it in terms of team, that if one person could develop that over a period of time, then that is a microservice. Or if it's a group of people that could work independently on a service, that is a microservice. Um, well, for us, uh, we've been working with a client, and for us, what really worked out uh, is defining those services in terms of domain. So each service does just one thing, and it does that one thing right. So that one thing could take 100 lines of code, or it could take uh, 1,000 lines of code. Um, tying it to Unix philosophy, Unix philosophy um, we write programs, which are small programs. We've used sed, cat, all these small little programs. And then uh, use pipes to concatenate them and make them cohesive, make them work together. Um, in case of microservices, yeah, my HTTP is the new pipe because HTTP microservices are usually exposed over HTTP. And uh, each service does its own job and passes it on to the different service. It's also kind of uh, going back to the object-oriented philosophy. Uh, I talked about, there was a talk on solid principles, so uh, taking, uh, talk about single responsibility. The service, this service does just one thing. Uh, it has low coupling. It doesn't, it's not chatty with too many different services. At the same time, it uh, is cohesive. And it's small and does that one thing uh, well. And as the Jeff, uh, Jeff Bay says, uh, a uh, monolithic application, which is 100k lines of code, is nothing but uh, 100 1k line of uh, applications waiting to happen. Well, he has used the 1k line of code as a parameter for a microservice, but you get the idea, right? I mean, rather than having a big monolithic, monolithic application, break it down into smaller so that it's much more manageable. Um, so why do we use microservice? Uh, what's, what's the key objective? Uh, rather than answering that question, I would like to share my story or my journey of using microservice, so how we use microservice in one of the client projects. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, this happened a couple of years back when we started an engagement with a client. Uh, I'll give you a little history on the client. Uh, this is 
90 year old business uh, it's a social gaming company uh, it was a 90 year old business and it was quite funny to hear on the first day that their customers were literally dying um, not dying out but literally dying because of the age so yeah lots of legacy codes over this period of 90 years they have accumulated like a lot of code acquired a few companies uh, the tech stack was mixed of VB scripts, VB6 forms, and Oracle, and all crazy stuff. Um, because of these, uh, the flexi it was not flexible. The cost of introducing any change was like n uh, Even adding a simple feature on a customer was like changing three or four different systems and then uh, getting that through. So it was really, really painful. Um, all these uh, apps were fully functional in their own silos because of the various acquires and mergers. Um, but they, each of the apps had like concentrated complexity. There's, there's a lump of code uh, sitting there and nobody knows how it works. Um, when he started uh, talking more about it, uh, that's when we came with this idea that, oh, this sounds like we need to build something that is small, that is independent, that is composable, and that j does one thing. So that if there are four different applications wants to do payment, it's just one service which should be doing payment, right? Uh, if they want to store customer information, there should be just one service holding those customer information. So that's when, that's where our journey started uh, in building the microservices. What we've achieved so far is we have 10 microservices um, doing a bunch of things, 25 VMs in production, 60 plus VMs across other environments like QA, test, and uh, performance environments. And we could achieve one-click deployments uh, across all these environments. And you can guess if it's one-click deployment, who does the deployment? So it's product owners, it's QAs, anybody. Uh, There's an interesting story that uh, somebody, want, somebody at the client side wanted a dog to do the deployment. So press the button. Um, so for us, uh, microservices, uh, each of these 10 different microservices was like self-contained. Uh, they had like their own DB, their own contracts. Uh, they were running in their own process. Uh, talking to each other through HTTP. Uh, but how did we start? We didn't start with 10 microservices on day one, right? So uh, we tried to solve small and valuable problems. Uh, started with small piece of functionality like customer database and try to migrate that first. Uh, start with plain old services. So we didn't start. We, uh, we didn't start with microservices on day one. That, hey, this, uh, let's go with just one resource per service, or let's just go with uh, uh, one responsibility per service. We started with plain old service and uh, started realizing that some things could be moved out. Uh, so when services starting doing too much over the period of time, like you do object refactoring, we refactored services. So if service responsibility grown, we extracted them to smaller ones. Um, so I was, uh, as I was telling you uh, the, about the domain, which is uh, social gaming, typically uh, over the web, it has three or four components. So that's where we started the plain old services. There is catalog, which is cat game uh, catalog, uh, customers, the orders, and payments. We slowly realized that customer service is trying to talk to legacy too much. So start, we extracted out that as a different microservice uh, to talk to legacy database and those kind of things, and uh, eventually throw that away. The order started growing um, too much, so we abstract, extracted out orders into two, which is order processing. Uh, so the main order service now is responsible for just taking orders, uh, and there is a separate service for processing the orders, and there is a separate service for resulting, because it's a gaming company, so after 
uh, when you play uh, anything, uh, at the end of it, you get results. So there was this results service. Um, from a high level, you would still think that, well, it's OK. That just sounds like a plain old service, right? I mean, you had a like, lot of debates, like, why is this a uh, microservice? It's just, it's just service which is well designed. That's it, right? I mean, uh, had hard time people asking those questions that why, why, what is micro in these services? Well, for us, it was mainly the single responsibility fact that a customer service just does everything related to customer uh, data, and its boundaries are restricted to just customer, and it uh, never overstepped its boundaries. Um, you also said uh, each service has one resource, so customer service has just one resource. Uh, well, sometimes uh, it had two resources, so uh, especially with payments, when we started dealing with payments, it started having two or three resources because we had payment method, credit card, and debit card, which are like three resources in one service. But pulling them out into a different, uh, their own microservice would mean that we're breaking that uh, uh, comp law of composition and uh, the services, the payment service or a credit card service and the direct debit service would become too chatty and um, it would defeat the purpose of having a service. So they communicate over uh, RESTful contract, HTTP and JSON. Um, so it's over the period of time uh, when we were into that journey, had some thumb rules around what really uh, we should do to make these services uh, micro and keep the complexity to a minimum is one top level resource, as we just talked about, uh, well, in some cases, two. Uh, focus on contracts, so that is very important for each service, that the contract should be driven made it clear that contracts should be driven mainly based on uh, the domain and not the client. So it, if the clients, uh, the consumer of the service needs certain additional information or summary information or those kind of things, uh, then uh, what I have seen is many of places we end up creating those service uh, endpoints and those becomes unmanageable. So we focus a lot of contract, uh, lot of it on contracts. Uh, each service had their own context and uh, they're not allowed to access uh, data which is beyond their context. Anyway, each of the service has their own database, so they, it was anyway not possible, but we made a point that uh, even if something is accessible, uh, some data is accessible and you're not, uh, uh, it is beyond the domain, so call the service rather than directly using the data source. Uh, avoid too much of coupling between the services. Again, since they are in independent, we try to avoid a uh, lot of coupling uh, between the services. And uh, since now we have 10 different applications, each of them logging in their own, each of them having uh, uh, running in their own process, it was really important to uh, have a sophisticated logging and monitoring framework uh, so that if anything breaks, we get to know immediately. If uh, any of the request fails through logs, we can immediately catch those uh, errors or exceptions. Um, so having said that, uh, following those thumb rules, there were, we ended up creating few cross-cutting services, which, is, uh, span, which was needed across all the other microservices. Uh, so going back to the services that we had, we ended up having a communication service because there was a lot of communication to the clients around, hey, your payment is due next month, uh, welcome, welcome message, or maybe result message that, hey, you have won uh, this particular game. Uh, so each of these services had their own communication. Uh, so we abstracted out the communication, the cross-cutting concerns around all the services, created a communication service, and um, all the service needs to do is just ping that communication service and say that, hey, send uh, the communication that customer has won. And it's the communication service responsibility to figure out 
whether to send an email communication or um, or SMS communication or whatever. Uh, there were a lot of scheduled jobs across uh, these uh, services, like need to send a weekly email to customers, uh, payment emails and stuff. So uh, those scheduling was part of all these services, so abstracted out in a separate service, so that it would just ping the service and uh, uh, schedule anything on any service. And we talked about error reporting already. Uh, so it was abstracted out as a separate service, so it would log a request to one common place and uh, it could do a search and those kind of stuff on uh, this error reporting tool. Um, so having these farm of services, uh, what uh, usually hear about uh, thing is service explosion. Um, so you have these services, it's difficult to uh, for a developer to check out them and uh, deploy them and things like that. So how do you stay productive in spite of having uh, these many services? Um, well, we use Ruby and Rails. Uh, use Rails API to build the uh, uh, service endpoints. Uh, focus a lot of, a uh, lot of our focus was on DevOps to make things as simple as possible. Uh, in terms of deployment, in terms of setting up a dev box and stuff. Um, we used feature toggles uh, instead of feature branches because doing feature branches with a service-oriented architecture is like really, really difficult and having CI and CD pipeline itself is like really difficult. Um, we also created a lot of client gems for these microservices. Uh, the client gems basically uh, that provides ease to talk to you to the service, so you it would feel like you're calling a service in memory because it gives you a nice object. You just call a, a service using that object, and you get an object back. And a mantra was automate, automate, whatever it is, whatever is the repetitive process, just automate everything. Um, so how do I make a small change and still stay sane? Um, I mean, if we make a small change, how do we make sure that everything works properly um, if that change happens? The answer is simple, test it. And uh, if you're thinking of something like this, <laughs> then this is the answer. <laughs> It's funny only when it is a joke. I mean, if you're building an enterprise software or any software, it's important to have tests. Um, so started off with unit tests in each of the services, uh, whether the object within the service is doing the right thing. But then that's too obvious, right? I mean, everybody of us write unit tests. And we love our spec. Uh, the contract test, uh, which is, uh, is my service doing what it should, uh, which is basically out of container test. So we ping an endpoint in memory service and uh, see whether we're getting the right response. And there is, uh, and we test the contracts. These are basically black box, block, black, black box test, uh, which test the contract. Uh, send something and get a return, uh, get some response back. Don't worry about the implementation. Uh, the next is integration test. The acceptance test is for uh, the boundaries within within the service itself. Uh, in integration test, we test whether this particular service is behaving nicely with other service. So if this service is calling some other service or testing the user flow, uh, then we write wrote unit test. Um, it tests the distributed effect. If anything fails, then actually is the error getting reported in the errors, uh, error reporting service. Or if the payment is getting uh, deducted, then is the, get, is the customer getting communication or, or not. Um, so test async action. A lot of actions were async, like when you're sending a communication, it's all async. Um, so we were using uh, Rescue for it, and there's nice plugin in Rescue that lets you test async actions. Um, 
So you've built these microservices. Uh, how do we actually ship it? Um, as James Lewis says, uh, we are essentially building the complexity of building the software to actually the infrastructure. So instead of now having one application to deploy, now we have to deploy like 100 applications uh, of 1K line each. Um, so the code becomes simple, easy to understand, but infrastructure is slightly complicated. Um, so we provision, we use Puppet Solo. At some part of time, we would like to use Docker as well. Um, so provisioning, uh, it begins at home. So even the dev box are provisioned. So that if there is any change in any of the uh, version of the software, the same scripts are used across all the environments. Um, so script goes through CI, like application code, the Puppet script, uh, we're gonna see that in the CI uh, pipeline slide, and immutable server, as Brian was talking about it in the morning. So it doesn't make sense for server to be mutable if you're using provisioning script. Um, this is how our uh, integration pipeline, continuous integration pipeline looked like. Um, we had the UI test, each, each of the um, boxes at the top is unit tests. Um, so there's UI, there is service, there is a puppet code which flows through uh, integration, UAT performance, and eventually to production. Uh, all this is one-click deployments uh, across environments. Um, so with every check-in, uh, we run unit test, run integration test that we've written, run acceptance test, and uh, build a package. This is really important because that same version of the package uh, would be deployed across all the other, other environments. And the most important thing is we shipped often, like weekly or less than that, uh, just ship uh, whatever you have. And we shipped it like FedEx. Um, so talking about CI and CD, uh, followed that in the project, what did it actually give us is single click deployments. Uh, we managed to get cut down the server deployments from uh, to actually three minutes. So each change would actually take like three minutes to deploy to server uh, to production. Um, we had a farm of 25 servers, and everything just works. Uh, the deployments and everything um, just works like a charm. Um, yeah, and so easy that our product owner does it. Um, we made a point that since we are adding a lot of uh, microservices uh, and refactoring to microservices, the cost of adding any of these services should be as low as possible. Um, so we managed to cut that time to less than, uh, less than a day. And uh, right from creating a project to taking that, that empty project to production was less than a day. Um, so having uh, talked about microservice, uh, when do we use the microservice? It's not a silver bullet, right? I mean, uh, it comes with a cost. So these are some of the trade-offs, the benefits and uh, the cost associated with them. Uh, so the benefit is you get small, uh, reusable and maintainable code, uh, which are throwaway. You can just rewrite them and stuff. Um, but at the same time, you'll have like a complex infrastructure because you need to deploy those independent services, the individual codes. Um, each service would grow independently. Uh, you can divide the team such that uh, uh, based on services, and each service would uh, keep growing on their own um, with the teams. Uh, but on the same side, uh, on the other side, uh, the learning curve is quite huge in microservice because now you have to deal with multiple applications and developers uh, would find hard to uh, know what's happening in the other service. Um, they scale independently as they are in their own process. They have their own database. Uh, you can make deployments as that if there is any service which is not heavily loaded, uh, you can make uh, 
uh, rational use of the infrastructure rather than uh, uh, having monolithic app and uh, um, running fat servers. At the same time, there is uh, network overhead in terms of going through the HTTP, going through over the wire and calling those services. Uh, they have independent DBs, so if there is high load on database, the database could be scaled independently. But at the same time, they end up having a fragmented data and the reporting and all becomes slightly difficult. <laughs> well, uh, that's all I had. Uh, questions? Your last comment is the perfect segue into my question, which was, this seems like it would make reporting a fucking nightmare. So is it slightly difficult or is it a fucking nightmare? Well, uh, <laughs> Well, some, uh, some of the complex reports become like fucking nightmare, <laughs> as you said. Um, in some of the cases, what we have uh, tried out is uh, dump these data into a warehouse and start developing reports out of that. Uh, there are some plugins with uh, PostgreSQL where it allows you to connect to multiple databases and run SQL query across databases. Uh, that worked out in some cases. In some cases, it was uh, just fetch the data if it's small enough and do it in memory. So it, it, it depends on the usage. Um, if the data is really, like, really huge, then first case where you dump that in a warehouse would really would work fine. Um, how do you deal with uh, versioning the services and what services you're talking to from presumably you have something talking to all of them? Um, so, as you saw the deployment pipeline, um, it, uh, to start with, we said, okay, let's not do versioning at all in the services. Let's deploy all, everything or nothing. Uh, so, l rather than picking up what needs to be deployed, we made our deployment script intelligent enough to figure out if there is a change, it would deploy, otherwise it won't. Um, and since uh, in the deployment, uh, in the CI pipeline, you have tested that, hey, this version of the service uh, works nicely with these other versions of the service. Uh, we would deploy that whole lump of uh, all the services together or and roll back if needed all the services together. Um, this is just to simplify so that we don't end up having too many versions and too many um, um, making code unmaintainable, basically. Uh, a couple of questions if you don't mind, or we could take turns. Um, on your client library gems, did you, uh, did you did you settle on something like there are a few uh, JSON schema standards that are being talked about that sort of make it easier to like the client libraries can be sort of discovering the layout of an API? Did you use anything like that, or is it kind of that? Long? Um, so we used Hashi Gem, if you have heard of that. Uh, mm -hmm. That worked out really well, where we could actually. Uh, create the objects, create the models and stuff and really nicely using a DSL. Um, yeah. Okay, and the other one, if you don't mind, uh, have you found a need or used any tools or built any tools? Like, I think Twitter built something that I could probably spell out specific. It was for tracing transactions that go through multiple services. Like, if you have some issues that come up, especially with the versioning question, yeah. like, do you have a hard time? Debugging something that goes through multiple services with the, you mentioned a lot of logging and monitoring yeah. structure you have, but is there any specific tool for sort of being able to follow a particular transaction through multiple services? So uh, we passed in a unique identifier from the main caller. So the UI uh, layer, which talks to these service, would typically pass in a common header, uh, which would be a unique identifier, and if this service is calling some other service, it would pass on the same identifier. And the logging actually makes sure that we are using that particular identifier. So when you're searching in Splunk or any other log aggregator service, all you need to do is just check based on that identifier to trace where all the requests went through. Thank you. Hey, I was wondering if you, how you went about uh, testing the um, contract of the service. Did you use any particular tools? Did you find something helpful? Um, actually, uh, our spec has it. Uh, our spec has a way to test the contracts uh, without actually spinning up the 
uh, the server, like we do controller test, right? You hit an endpoint and see if uh, it is uh, returning uh, the proper response. If you do a render view on top of it, uh, it will actually render the view, it will actually render the JSON and give you back the response. So we just use plain RSpec. So uh, does it actually help you test it uh, once the API of the client or the server changes, it breaks the client? Or is um, this some, some automated or uh, do you need to do some manual intervention there? So, so the contract test were, was about testing the contracts in isolation. So you just test that services contract. And if there is any change and if there is any breakage, we don't allow to promote that particular package any further. Uh, there was also integration uh, test pipeline, which tests uh, whether this a uh, particular service is able to contact, uh, works together with other services. Um, for that, again, we used uh, RSpec uh, to test the contracts and test its distributed effect across multiple services. You calculate overhead of utilization RAM and CPU. Okay, so you're talking about, uh, did we calculate uh, CPU utilization and memory overhead, right? I mean, every basic application takes some RAM. RAM. If you make multiple applications, it's small RAM, so there's small applications. Yeah. So what is the difference in your case? Um, so as I said, I mean, these, uh, since we could uh, um, break down the domain into multiple apps, it was uh, uh, really interesting to, you know, spin up, let's say, um, 10 uh, instances of customer service because that is heavily loaded, that needs login and we don't want customers to lose out on that. While uh, the uh, payment service or communication service, which is, is communication service is async, so we just spin up just one instance of communication service. So we played around with a lot of uh, those combinations to uh, optimize the infrastructure usage. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks, Anand. Thank you.